I'll, I'll talk about why um, Passmore, just being here is special to me. I grew up in Oroshenia and currently live in Castlebar, but my summers were spent just at the end of this drive. Um, that we used to come for a good week every summer and spend time at my Uncle Cecil's. Here, he lived right beside his Japanese neighbor, and we were swimming in the water at the um, curve of the lake, so this has always held fond memories for me. It's lovely to come and be able to speak to you in a, a lodge as beautiful as this, so it really does feel like coming home a bit, just not summertime, and I'm not about to go swimming. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm tickled to be here today, and I will be discussing my, a bit of my family history and the history of the Duke of Wars coming in. So it was a wonderful segue from the previous story because what happened in this valley and then when the Duke of Wars arrived. So um, my story is the first settlers to arrive in BC, first Duke of Wars settlers to arrive in BC um, and the settlement of Waterloo. For those of you who are not familiar where Waterloo was, um, this is a, it was a small mining camp, so again from our previous story, located on the site of where some of you might know the former Debordee riding stables in Odishenia. So if you've been to the Castle Bar Airport, that is on one bench, and then if you drop down a few benches staying on that side of the river, um, it is a small, currently very lovely fishing spot. They have a lovely uh, fishing spot there, but that was the settlement of Waterloo. So I'm just going to um, regress a tiny bit, and for those of you who might have not been familiar with uh, the bit of the Duke of War history, how did Duke of Wars end up in Canada in the first place? Duke of Wars are uh, Russian people who um, had pacifist beliefs and they basically ran afoul of the Tsar and he exiled them at that time to the Mokri Gore or the Wet Mountains region in the Caucasus right on the border with Turkey. And his avid belief was that if he left them there long enough, um, the warring tribes would take care of them in the crossfire and he wouldn't have to do anything with them. Um, these people were very persistent and uh, with the help of Tolstoyans and the Society of Friends, as we know them, Quakers, both in England and with, in Canada, um, ships were um, arranged, uh, transport was arranged on ships and um, four to five shiploads of Duke of Wars, over 8,000 people arrived in Canada in um, 1999 and in the few years thereafter. Because of the Homestead Act in Canada, Duke of Wars were given lands in Saskatchewan, um, starting from Saskatoon and going up all the way to Prince Albert, and they were referred to as colonies, Duke of War colonies. And each colony had several villages, and my grandmother came from a village called Troitska, or protected by the Trinity type of thing. It was the same name, um, <coughs> Of the, as the village that she came from in Russia. So they didn't, they didn't actually bother renaming things. If the village was named Troitska in Russia, they set, set up that village here because then they knew who belonged. And it, they just came wholesale like that. Um, it worked well for the first few years, but by 1905, there was a crunch for land already in Saskatchewan. Well, it wasn't, this was named Saskatchewan in 1905, but there was a crunch for land already, and Duke of Wars, um, had, you working communally, had managed to um, farm and make uh, arable 500,000 acres of land. So their land was producing much faster than someone who came to Homestead by himself with possibly one or two family members to help. Um, the Minister of the Interior of, uh, at the time, Frank Oliver, said, uh, if you want to keep your homestead land, you must swear an oath of allegiance to the crown. At that time, for Duke Boris, who had just left Russia because of their pacifist beliefs, because of their um, opposition to serving in the military, they saw that as possibly something that would be against their beliefs. Plus, they really truly felt that they could not swear allegiance to anyone but to their god. And it's funny, I know I used to work for the federal government. At that time, I didn't swear allegiance either. I affirmed that I would serve the crown. And it was just a strong point, a strong issue with us. So um, a small group of Duke Wars did register their lands independently, and they did um, maintain, uh, retain their lands. But by large, um, uh, 10,000 people had to relocate someplace. So what to do? The community gathers and they decide to send 
three representatives to find the land that would be available for them to settle. At that time, they um, were vegetarian and they ate vegetables, fruits. Um, uh, they needed land that would be good for them. So they investigated, they, there was land available in the Fraser Valley and they were going to look at that. There was certainly tracts of land available in Oregon and in California. And so they got together a delegation of three people. They had their leader, Peter Lord Berrigan, they called him, or Piotr Ketchushka. And they had um, Simeon Rigen and Nikola Ziberov. So these three people set off from Saskatchewan and they were on their way to Oregon to look and possibly purchase some land. But to get to Oregon, you had to take the CPR and they hit the head of the lake, uh, the head of the Creepy Lake, and then they took the steamer into Nelson. And they were going to continue, as mentioned, to Bonus Ferry, Spokane, and keep going south. But they, um, that for very first evening in Nelson, ran into a um, real estate agent and former uh, engineer, and he was a bit of an unscrupulous fellow. He had just purchased about um, uh, quite a bit of land uh, in and around Nelson, and he wanted to be able to sell it. So he, um, I don't remember his name here, and I had it on my notes, but I left my notes were right there. Um, but it'll come to me. Lang Fisher was his last name, Claude Lang Fisher. So Mr. Fisher prepared a beautiful little um, brochure because he wanted to um, make someone want to buy his land. It was located about 25 miles west of Nelson. He had a brochure, and in the brochure he actually included um, plans for how to get uh, irrigation into this site. So he sold this idea to the party of three, and uh, so much to the point that they went out the next day to actually look at the land. So they took the train from Nelson to Castlebar, and Castlebar is not as we know it today. Again, there was just a little ferry uh, stop and a little train stop. So they actually continued um, on the train um, to what was called Waterloo Siding. Uh, so those of you who've been in, on Columbia, and Castle, uh, Columbia Avenue in Castlebar, and you know where the Kootenai Valley Water and Spa uh, building is, that was Waterloo Siding. So they got off the train there and they hoofed it down to First Avenue, closer to the river, and they flagged um, someone on the other side who came across by boat and took them over, and they um, were going to inspect the land. So what was the first thing they found there that appealed to them was that there were already outbuildings there, uh, buildings from the former mining encampment from Placer Mining um, that uh, existed there and also a lumber operation. So right away, these people had to get out of Saskatchewan. They were dispossessed, so they had to have some place to go. So right away there was some place where a work party could live while the land was cleared and that appealed to Berrigan. But the land was so thick with fir and with pines that when they looked up, they could not see the sky. It was that thick. And uh, initially, they were a little bit hesitant, like, what are we going to do with, with all of these trees? And then they said, no, the trees are our friends. We will use the lumber to build our, our buildings. We will sell what lumber we need to get money for supplies and equipment. When they actually looked at the land and the quality of the land, if you've ever lived in Odishen, and I know some of you are from Odishen, you know, or from that area, it is sand. It's pure white sand that was deposited there by the river. So um, Tolstoy, who had been in exile in Siberia in the tundra, and he said, this is not going to work. So he'd already said to Claude Lang Fisher, thank you very much, have a nice day, we're about to leave. But Mr. Fisher, he was quite unscrupulous, and he knew that he needed a little backup plan. So he had paid some of his friends in Nelson to come about an hour after them, arrive and say, hey, we want to buy this land and we're prepared to buy it in 100 acre lots. That put pressure on Berrigan to make a decision right away and he bought it. He bought it. For $50 an acre, he bought the land. He said, we will make this land work for us. We will make things grow here. What we need is a lot of manpower and that is the one thing I have a lot of. So um, he actually looked at the valley itself and he said, the air in this valley is as pure as the spas of Switzerland. He says, we could not live 
in a better place. The land was a bit more, uh, the cult climate was a bit more milder than what they were used to in Saskatchewan, and certainly much milder than where they were in the Caucasus. So the very next day, he signed his um, contract, he made his purchase, and he sent a telegram to Saskatchewan saying, within a week, I want 100 people on a train here to clear the land. And that was where my grandmother and her, um, and my grandfather come into play. They had been living in Saskatchewan. She had arrived as a 12-year-old girl on the very first boat. And at 13, it was expected that you would take on the duties of an adult female in the community. So from the age of 13, she had been working in the fields, cooking, cleaning, whatever needed to be done, she had been working as an adult female. Her mother had died when she was 18, so in addition to her duties to the community, she was then fully expected to take charge of her father, um, her younger brother, Fedya, and her grandfather, Kalesnikov, who lived with them. They were not prepared to see her fly off to British Columbia because they needed someone to look after them. So they were a little bit hesitant to agree to this, but she had fallen in love. <laughs> and that love does strange things. So her uh, suitor, uh, Sabeli Kanigan, Kanigan, as you know, there's some families living here, um, he um, was definitely going to be in that first party of people going. And he had said, if we're going, let's get married and let's go. But his mother, Masha Kanigina, had no use for my grandmother because she was not a, one of the prominent Dukovar families. And Kanigine are very prominent and they must have somebody who would make their family stronger. And in those days, marriages were all arranged. You did, I mean, maybe you fell in love, but most of the time it was some sabaha, which is a Russian term for an aunt or an older woman who would come and say, okay, you would make a nice husband for her because we want to have people who are married, producing children, and being adding to the community. We won't have, if we have a lot of single people, single people hanging around, it just creates problems. And so they were very quick, very quick to get people settled in. Um, it worked to their favor that um, the move was happening so quickly, um, and pressure um, forced Masha Kanigina to agree to her son marrying my grandmother. They married and were on the train. But their leader, um, Peter Lordley Berrigan, had decreed that they could not take more than three changes of clothing. They were going off into the wild blue yonder to, to settle land, and all they could take was three changes of clothing. Work clothing and maybe something for Sunday, because they had to travel fast, and they had to travel um, in such a way where they could carry the supplies needed to break the soil and to clear the land. So their job was to take picks, uh, picks and axes and shovels, and very little of anything else. They didn't take any livestock. They didn't take chickens for eggs. They took enough supplies to last two weeks. And after that, forage. See what you can find. So when they arrived in Castlebar and they walked and crossed the river, um, the first thing they did was make arrangements, arrangements to make the camp habitable. Well, what are they going to eat? So while the men are already clearing the land, the women went to the first neighbor, and his name was Hiram Landis, who lived just um, a few, I'm going to say, not even half a mile down, uh, on the same side of the river, and half a mile down from them. And he had left, because they'd arrived at the end of April, he had left uh, some potatoes in the field, because he didn't need them. And he allowed them to dig up those potatoes. He shared um, excess milk that he had from his cows with them, so they were able to feed their community of 100 that had arrived. But they were excellent foragers. Uh, they brought seeds with them, and because that whole area, you've got the uh, Selkirk Mountains, the Monashi Range of the Selkirk Mountains on one side, and then you've got several plateaus that lead down to the river. Um, they, as the men were clearing, the women had found an area where they could plant their garden. Um, that area they called Klivirok, which meant the clover patch. And that is exactly where the road begins up the hill to Salmo from the Castlebar side. There was a little creek, it would flood, it was very good soil, and they were able to grow enough vegetables in that little patch to last them through the winter. So that was the work of the women. They, um, there was one woman assigned to about 10 or 11 men, and her job was to make sure that they had something to eat, three meals a day. Uh, her job was to ensure that their clothes were washed and their quarters were clean. Their job was to make sure that 
The men were in good order to do the clearing that was necessary. And how did the men do the clearing? They had brought saws and picks and axes, but as they, um, they realized pretty quickly they needed other equipment, so they would take the logs that they had initially sawn, bail them up, sometimes with willow switches, other times with wire, if they could find it, leftover wire, and they would float the logs down the river to the smelter and trail. They would sell the logs for cordwood, and they would use the money to purchase supplies, but more importantly, to purchase equipment to build their first sawmill with which they could then cut the logs into pieces that they would use to build villages. So again, the men got to the task of building, building villages. They arrived by the, at the end of April in that first year, 1907, and um, they had nine villages, similar to what, if you've ever been to the Duke of War Discovery Center, the two large buildings connected by both buildings, they had built nine villages at the end of the first year. And for the women, they, I'm just going to explain some of the things that they lived on. If you've ever had a Ducour neighbor, you know that when spring comes, there are certain things we pull from the forest. So there's the suzuki, the false Solomon seal. Uh, there's the kapiva, the stinging nettle. There's the um, pigweed or uh, nibida that Ducours will eat and, and thoroughly enjoy. We wait um, until the snow recedes to pull dandelion and eat dandelion leaves. <coughs> so these are things in addition to scavenging or collecting mushrooms of all sorts, um, uh, wild hazelnuts in the fall, and even um, the berries, the wild strawberries, thimbleberries, blueberries, um, they made sure that they had something to eat. Something that was interesting for me was that the nature of the work that the men were doing required a lot of protein for them, and they were eating a vegetarian diet. At that time, their leader said to them, if you need more protein in your diet, feel free to eat varenia schvostikum, jam with a tail. So they managed to eat fish, and they supplemented their diet with fish from the river itself, because otherwise they just wouldn't have had the energy to do what they needed to do. Although they wanted to remain vegetarian, it was a fact of life, they had to get stuff happening. So, I end my tale with the fact that it was not all hard work and no play, because two children were born within that year. And the first child was born to the Faminov family, and there are lots of Faminovs. I see Fami's Bakery, same family, provided the delicacies for us today. And um, Peter Lord de Verigan actually asked permission from the family to name that first child, and he named him Brilliant from the waters of the brilliance of the Kuni River. So that was the first child, and the second child was born to my grandmother, and she named her son Lobote. So, thank you very much.